I'm really a guy who lives out in the woods. I don't have any of those special fancy titles. But I am a father, and I want my children to live in a Christian nation. Well, welcome back to the Lone Bull Work. Uh, that that intro, that great intro, was made by William Swillis. You'll find him on Twitter. He did a second intro for me, and I will I'll post that. I'll use that as well if you follow my channel. So again, follow William Swillis uh, on Twitter. All right, today I want to talk about can Reformed people who believe in Reformed theology can they cite Aristotle? <laughs> That's a simple way to put the question. This goes back to a a little um, dispute that occurred after Eric Kahn posted something about Aristotle approvingly. And he was accused of a lot of things, but one of the things he was accused of that I think is worth talking about is he was accused of using a pagan source. Why should we care what Aristotle or Plato or any of these people have to say? And uh, so what I want to do is basically show why in a reformed theological system, you can take people like Aristotle, Plato, Seneca, Plutarch, you can take those guys seriously. And I'm going to do that by going to Calvin. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through the places where he did cite Calvin. He did several times. He cited Cicero more than anyone. And he cited just dozens of pagan sources approvingly, not to just criticize, but approvingly. Um, but I want to show why he could do that. There is a tendency in our in 20th century and now 21st century reform thinking. Uh, to think that anything that resembled a kind of like medieval, uh, med medieval methodology or medieval conclusions, medieval premises, these are all just holdovers from the medieval period, uh, like Christendom. So Christendom, I've heard this several times, usually from like the radical two kingdom people. Uh, that is that Christendom was just a holdover. They just couldn't get their minds away from Christendom. They just didn't think enough about their system to realize that actually the, the, the Reformed view of the gospel precludes uh, Christendom or having a Christian public order, Christian magistracy. I find that really silly and ridiculous. It, it's like saying that, yeah, you have, you have hun hundreds, thousands of thinkers who just didn't realize. They didn't realize that when the Reformation happened, the logic of the Reformation means secular, like just you can't attach Christian to nation. You can't attach Christian to government. You can't attach Christian to civil ruler. Somehow they just didn't, they never realized that until the, you know, uh, uh, what's his name, um, uh, showed up and Roger Williams showed up and had the, they had the fight with the, the theocrats in new England. Now all that's ridiculous and silly and absurd. And it's, it's tough to take people seriously who make those sorts of claims, but the, it's also, like, I think, because of a modern education, people just haven't read C uh, Cicero, they haven't read Aristotle, they haven't read Plato. And so, all this stuff is very kind of foreign to them. And so, they see uh, someone like Calvin and others citing these guys, and they're like, well, that must just be a holdover from Christendom. Well, in a way, it was that that, that was the educational base of, of the time. And so, you're going to read these guys, and we don't today. So, that, that's kind of understandable. But what, what I want to show is how someone like Calvin could consistently, coherently affirm total depravity, I believe the, you know, reform view of uh, the reform theological views, and at the same time, cite someone like uh, Aristotle. Now, where I'm going to go to for this is, is, is in his institutes, but not, not, not chapter, not book four, chapter 20, like people usually go for his politics, and that's fine. Um, nor am I going to go to the first 10 chapters where people, the only chapters they usually read of Calvin. Um, I'm going to go to book two, uh, chapter two, sections 12 through about 24. And th this is a crucial place. So whenever people say like, how do you, where do you need to go to understand Calvin's politics? I, I usually, I don't say like book four, chapter 20. I say, you've got to read, you've got to read Institutes 2 to 12 and on. Because when, you know, I've said this before, when you're, when you're, when you're asking, when you're talking about like the theoretical questions of politics, you first have to answer the question, what is man? Because politics is, is simply the arrangement of humans in a society and how the government is going to enact on that, how people are going to arrange themselves constitutionally, 
um, social customs, how are they going to relate in social life? That's just the broad view of politics. And so you have to understand what man is in order to even begin to, to talk about what he is in his social life and what sort of goods and ends should he pursue in that. Um, and this is where Calvin, I think in, in all places I've read, this is the, this is the place where he most discusses that. Uh, and so let's, let's just kind of jump into this again, the Institutes 2.2, we can switch over um, to that. You should see that in your screen now. Um, so this, I'm going to start on section 12 and I'm going to go through this again. What's the purpose of this? The purpose is to answer the question why Calvin can consistently cite people like Aristotle and Plato and such. Now, um, because this is, I, I would say, what is reflected here is not only the, the classical Christian position, I'd say, but also it's, a, it's part of the Reformed Orthodox view as well. So if you're going to talk about Reformed Orthodoxy, um, then th this is going to apply with a little bit of, a, you know, I guess, qualification as I'll get into. But he goes off right, right from the beginning. He, dis he distinguishes these two gifts. He says, man, he, he appeals to Augustine. He says he distinguishes between natural gifts and supernatural gifts. Now, by gifts, he doesn't mean like presence. He means like powers, faculties, that kind of thing, the sort of properties of man that God has essentially endowed man with. So you have natural and supernatural. Um, later on in the Reformed tradition, you will see the, uh, people like Turretin not want to use kind of distinction of natural and supernatural, uh, but he'll say that there, he'll still distinguish between basically what's essential to man as man, which would be the natural gifts in this case, and the supernatural and the, um, and, and what's accidental or perfective. Okay. So that allows him to say that, that man as man cannot lose his natural gifts, but, but, uh, he can lose these, these, as Calvin call them, the supernatural ones. And that's precisely what Calvin said. He says that the supernatural gifts were withdrawn and the natural gifts were corrupted. So in the original state, Adam had this complete set of gifts that, that were suitable for his purposes and his end and, and completing his task, his divine task. Um, but in, in his sin, uh, some gifts, the, the supernatural gifts, which were, you could say, accidental, meaning they weren't essential to him as man, um, were withdrawn, and then that rendered the other ones corrupted by sin. Okay. But he still retains those natural ones. Now, he'll, he'll define these uh, uh, more in a later section, but early on, you could say, you could, we can see that the supernatural gifts, they concern, as he said, the light of faith and righteousness, and they were sufficient you know, the proper exercising of those gifts to their proper ends was sufficient for the attainment of heavenly life and everlasting felicity. Sorry, I can't draw straight lines. But um, now what this means, and I would say this is the majority opinion in the Reformed tradition, that is that Adam's ultimate end, even in a state of integrity, was the attainment of heavenly life. There was, in other words, like there was going to be a state of glory. That's not something post-gospel. We're in the gospel alone. In fact, the gospel restores us to the original end of Adam, which was heavenly life, a state of glory. Um, but because, and, and those were the essentially the telos of the natural gifts. Their, their intent was to, to I mean, there was, there was a sense of in which the, the, the supernatural completed the whole, but nevertheless, their, their principal end was pointing man to God the light of faith, righteousness, and attainment of heavenly life. So once those are gone, you can you can clearly see what happens is that man no longer has a, a proper orientation to the, the higher things to heavenly life. Okay. But he says, yeah, they were raised over eternal salvation. But now we are exiled from the kingdom of God and all the things that pertain to blessed life and the soul are extinguished in him until he re uh, recovers them by the grace of regeneration. All right, so now that now he doesn't have those things, um, and this this explains why the the pagan the when pagans talk even the, the the brightest of them talk about theology they make a lot of errors. So there were some who actually did quite quite well. Like Plato has a doctrine of simplicity um, that that's very similar to the classical doctrine of simpl simplicity. But nevertheless, I mean, constantly, whenever there's negative, most of the time when, when there's negativity from reform writers in relation to, to pagan authors, it's on their theology, you know, because, and why is that? Well, because they lack the grace of regeneration, 
they still have a sense of the divine, as Calvin mentions in early in his institutes. They still have a sense of divinities, of, 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 of divinity, of, of divine. There's some kind of heavenly thing. There's something, there's e- eternality of the soul, which is something that um, Plato ident- uh, recognizes. And uh, nevertheless, because they lack those gifts, they tend also to draw it to uh, uh, to the, the, their thoughts that should be directed solely above are then tossed down to th- the things of the earth. And so they create idols out of the things of the earth to try to capture divinity. Um, and that's just a product of the loss of the, of this, the, the, those supernatural gifts. Okay. So it's, it's, they've been thrown down in a way to earth and then they create gods for themselves, usually in their image in some capacity um, from the things of, of this earth. So for this reason, this is why you you typically don't take your theology from from Aristotle uh, or from, or from uh, the, the pagan sources. Um, but nevertheless, and so, okay, and then, so for the rest of this section, Calvin uh, kind of talks, you can read it, talks a lot about uh, the kind of the, the darkness of the human mind, um, depravity, he mentions... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, the, the smothered by a cloud of darkness, it cannot shine forth to any good effect. So he's very negative here. This is something if you read this as a typical modern Calvinist, and yeah, this is right. Yeah, darkness of heart, everything bad, shapeless ruins. You know, all, is all that remains. Okay, but then he kind of transitions a bit. I mean, he does go go back and be negative again, but he transitions it a bit and he says, but pretty much to charge it as perpetual blindness. To, that that is to leave no intelligence is is repug is repugnant not only to the word of God but to common experience. Now this it, it should be telling that Calvin appeals to common experience, meaning that it's true that from your experience with non Christian authors, non Christian and the, and for him for the most part it would be the pagan sources that he he was educated in. That common experience shows that there can actually be very um, profound intelligence on certain matters uh, from non-Christians. And why would that be? Well, because what's implanted in the human mind is a certain desire for investigating truth. So that's actually a good Aristotelian claim that we're kind of oriented, seeking after the truth. That is in what he mentions down here, the lower animals. That's again what um, uh, what Aristotle claims is that that kind of distinguishes us from the brutes, is that, uh, is that we have this naturally influenced love of truth. Good Aristotelian claim there. And then he goes negative. We fail, we fail between, before we reach the, gro- the goal. Uh, we'll fail to read it, uh, uh, the right path of, uh, of investigation. Of um, Yeah. All right. But now, so he's, he's negative. But this is where I think the, the modern Calvinist is going to be slightly uncomfortable. He says, still, however, man's efforts are not always so utterly fruitless as not to lead to some result especially when his attention is directed to inferior objects, okay? Now, why would, why would this be the case? Remember that the, the supernatural gifts are withdrawn, but the natural objects are, are just only corrupted. They're not removed, right? He says, uh, yeah, so it, it, has, it matters most in the present life, proper in order to... Yeah, and so he, this is where he distinguishes the types of intelligence. So you have to actually interpret what he says above by this the sort of intelligence that the the intelligence is the different kinds of intelligence that um, that are were possible at Adam having the the both sets of goods. But now one is gone. That means one set of in, of intelligence is actually removed. So he distinguishes between earthly things and heavenly things, and this is where he defines earthly things. I mean those which relate not to God and his kingdom, to true righteousness, future, but those have some connection with the present life and in a matter confined within its boundaries. By heavenly things, you know, the knowledge of God, true righteousness, and the mysteries of the heavenly kingdom. But in earthly things, it's a matter of policy and economy and mechanical arts and even liberal studies. So policy and economy. Um, policy, you can think of how we regulate our behavior in this world. Economy could be sort of man- like a man- managing households. You can even think of it as managing the, the civil community, mechanical arts being the, the various uh, um, kind of vocations that we take up, but also liberal studies. Well, well, liberal studies would be the leisure activities, 
it would be the reflection on reflecting on ethics, reflecting on politics, reflecting on metaphysics. You can think of this as, uh, um, you know, the the philosophical pursuits, the the pursuits of leisure of of a life of leisure. So even those are he considers earthly. Now, the the earthly, if we're musing on politics and ethics and the, and the life in this world. Now, if you're if you go above those things and start going going into heavenly things by reason alone, this is where most people um, begin uh, to fail. Okay. And, and he says, so boy, this, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, this is a really crucial section here to understand what, where Calvin gets at it. Since man is by nature a social animal, so he's appealing to that, that sense of which, like that, that old tradition of calling uh, man political animals, he is disposed from natural instinct to cherish and preserve society. Okay. Now, again, he's talking about man in his fallen state. This relates to the idea of earthly things because civil community is an earthly thing. Um, and so this means that man as a social animal is disposed by instinct to cherish and preserve society. All right. So he has an instinct. But he also says here that the minds have impressions for civil order and honesty. That is, you don't have only have an instinct to then kind of join into civil society to kind of cherish it, but also to see that it's preserved and there's civil order, meaning that there's regulation or say laws, and that people are honest among each other. There's honesty between each other. How can you, I mean, this is just, you can think of just pure rational self-interest, that you want to live in a society in which people feel obligated to be honest. Um, why is that? Because you can't then work with other people unless there's a degree of honesty with them. And so just a basic, uh, just basic experience in this world suggests that. And so, uh, so even pagan societies, pagan non-Christians who have no, no light of the grace of regeneration are still going to seek after civil honesty. And then he goes on more. Every individual, every individual understands that human societies must be regulated by laws and is also able to comprehend the principles of those laws. So they know that society must be regulated, and they can even comprehend the principles of those laws. That is, the good, um, the, the good sought via the laws. He even goes on and says there's universal agreement in regard to such subjects. That is, on, on earthly things, on regulation of laws and, principle, and the principles of those laws, among both nations and individuals. That that's, should be a startling statement to a modern Calvinist that Calvin would affirm, that Calvin would actually affirm that there is universal agreement among nations and individuals um, about the principles of the laws. And why would that, why would they have uh, this, this universal agreement? It's implanted in the breast of all without a teacher or lawgiver. It's implanted in them. It's one of those natural gifts that he mentioned earlier. And then someone might object and say, well, what about the wars and dissensions? And what about thieves and robbers and those who invert the rules of justice and loosen the bonds of law and they give free scope to their lust? And but how does he respond? So that, that's one objection to his system. And he, uh, uh, Turton has the same kind of um, saying he proposes, he proposes the same objections. Um, but what, what Calvin says, he responds, they do not hate the law from knowing that they uh, from not knowing that they are good and sacred. So in other words, he's saying that even people who are thieves and robbers and murderers, they, 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 they hate those laws not from a lack of knowing, they, they, but rather they, they're inflamed with headlong passion, quarrel with what is clear, clearly reasonable, and licentiously hate what their mind and understanding approves. So they're actually going against the very thing they know is good and bad. And again, he's talking about the, the the exceptional cases. Most people want to live a life of order and honesty and uh, and and under laws, so that they can accomplish what they are up to and seek in this life. Uh, okay. And so he said, "Look, the the quarrels that you could you could list the examples of the evils in the world, but that does not destroy the primary idea of justice. For while men dispute with each other as to the particular enactments." Their ideas of equity agree in substance. So their ideas of equity agree in substance. That, that is, everyone fundamentally agrees on these certain rules of justice uh, in the substance of them. Of course, you can apply them poorly. You can 
think that you think one idea of equity is good when it's actually bad, but there is still some universal sense of, of justice. And he says, well, okay, this shows that the human mind is weak, says it's weak. Um, but again, he says that still, it is true that some principle of civil order is impressed on all. And this is ample proof that in regard to the constitution of this present life, that is the earthly things of life, no man is devoid of the light of reason. All right. So what you, what you see here then is Calvin affirming that when it comes to earthly things, when it comes to earthly life, the things of this present life, which is with is like civil ethics, which is politics, mechanical arts, um, when it comes to those things, there is actually general agreement. Now, of course, there's wars and sin, there's sin all, all, all across the board. But, um, but that, according to Calvin, and Calvinists later on, uh, it is not an argument against the fact that, in general, nations and individuals agree on the equity and substance that they understand uh, that they need to live in a society that is uh, of civil order and honesty. Now, notice so far, there is actually nothing here about common grace. So, a lot of the, the, the Kyperians want to say, well, well, okay, well, the reason why things are okay is because of just common grace, and not because they actually know what they're doing, and not because they're following actually human nature um, uh, as it remains uh, post-sin. It's really just a product of grace. Um, and I, I think that's just, uh, there, there, there's a sense in which providentially in God's grace, uh, uh, first of all, there's the mercy of the fact that we're not just destroyed in our sin um, from the get-go, but there's also the, the fact that you can think of common grace as providentially bringing some societies more order in, than others. Nevertheless, I, th I think what Calvin is saying here is that that the society, that, that pagans who are, do are virtuous pagans, outwardly, of course, and in a civil sense, the, the, that virtue is flowing from the act, their actual constitution, from their nature. Be, why? Because they still retain those natural gifts from God. They are not withdrawn. They're not destroyed. They are just corrupted. And so some people are going to be more corrupted than others. Nevertheless, the ones that are the least corrupted they are following the principles of their being, and they're, they're coming to sound conclusions on political life. Um, so, of course, within the, the providence of God, some are more, uh, more corrupt or less corrupt than others. Um, nevertheless, you can attribute the reason, the, the reason why these, the, the virtue arose, um, or you can attribute the virtue that they, that they practice to their actual, um, the, the, the people themselves following the proper light that they still have within them. That is following the light of reason that remains. Okay. Now, keep going on. Uh, next, come to uh, manual liberal arts and learning, which is all of some degree of aptitude, the full force of acuteness is displayed. Again, not all are e equally able to learn all the arts. We have sufficient evidence of, common of, a, of a common capacity in the fact, and there is scarcely an individual who does not display intelligence in some particular art. And this capacity extends not merely to the learning of the art, but to the devising of something new and improving what has been previously learned. Okay, so he, he tax Plato briefly. briefly. Um, and, and look what he says here. While these proofs openly, openly attest the fact of a universal reason and intelligence naturally implanted. Okay, and then he says that that universality is a special gift of God. Nevertheless, is naturally implanted in man, man, and so when you see virtue, that is a product of that of nature working itself properly in in the in that in that person. Okay. And so then he gets to the to the profane authors. Profane authors meaning the the Greek authors. So someone like Aristotle, he says this is there. He's there. Therefore, notice therefore. Uh, the admiral light of truth displayed in them should remind us that the human mind, however much fallen and perverted from its original integrity, is still in adorned and in invested with admiral gifts from its creator. Uh, he says, if we reflect that the spirit of God is the fount of truth, we will be careful as we would avoid offering insult to him, nor to reject or condemn, condemn truth wherever it appears. Okay, so... This is kind of like the the idea of um uh, uh well what is it that that um that the truth is truth no matter what, no, no matter where it's found um yeah 
how, sh how shall we deny the possession of intellect to those who drew up rules of discourse and taught us to speak in accordance with reason? So again, like, shall we say that the philosophers, by which he means the, the pagan philosophers, and their exquisite researches and skillful description of nature, nature were blind? What shall we say of the mathematical sciences? Shall we deem them to be the dreams of madmen? Nay, we cannot read the writings of the ancients on these subjects without the highest admiration. He's, he's not talking about the church fathers. He's not talking about Thomas Aquinas. He's talking about Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Plutarch, Cicero. He's the, the, that's who he's talking about. Those are the ancients. So they improved on, in medicine and mathematics, um, in, uh, in, in rhetoric, speaking in terms of reason. Um, and so we should have an admiration, which, and look at this. He also said that, well, where does he say this? That taught us. That literally rules of discourse, that would be like um, reading Cicero's rhetoric or uh, um, uh, Aristotle's book on rhetoric, taught us to speak in accordance with, with reason. Like he, he's actually talking, he's saying that in his studies, he learned, he was taught how to do all these things from the pagan authors. And, uh, and this should be reflecting the fact that the first published book that Calvin ever wrote was actually on Seneca. As I understand, the story is, is that Erasmus did a was was put, put did some essay contest, and and Cicero submitted his some interpretation of Seneca to uh, for that that prize. I don't think he won, but anyway. Uh, but the point is here: admiration with their, with excellence with them. Shall we deem anything to be noble and praiseworthy without tracing it to the hand of God? So you can then read these guys. You can read Aristotle and Plato and, and get much and learn from it and, and let them teach you on these different things. And at the same time, and, and, and you can my, admire their gifts, uh, their excellence, but at the same time, you can trace it back to the hand of God. So there's no, there's no disconnect from appreciating a pagan author and uh, also uh, tracing it to the hand of God. And that would be, in his mind, an ingratitude. And an ingratitude not chargeable even on the heathen poets who acknowledge that philosophy and laws and all useful arts were the invention of the gods. Therefore, since it is manifest that men whom scripture term, scriptures term carnal are so acute and clear-sighted in the investigation of inferior things, again, it's important to highlight that, their example should teach us how many gifts the Lord has left possession of human nature, notwithstanding of its having been despoiled of the true good. Okay. So that should, I think, explain precisely why Calvin can appeal to someone like, uh, to someone like uh, Aristotle. I mean, isn't that... He's saying that, again, it goes back to the anthropology of the two sets of gifts. One was withdrawn, um, one is natural but corrupted, and there are some pagan writers who then excel on these different elements of learning precisely because implanted in them, are retain, they, they retain uh, reason, they retain understanding and intelligence. Um, and, but where, where they fail most, where they fail most is actually in theology, but not in politics, not in on um, human nature as it relates to politics, so not, you know, anthropology as it concerns politics, not in ethics, not in rhetoric, not in some of the, uh, the more theoretical philosophies like uh, in mathematics. And, uh, and so we can, we can read these guys, we can let them teach us with a tremendous amount of profit, profit. And if they're celebrated in your circles or in the world, then you can appeal to them even as a sort of authority on that topic. Um, it's arguable that you can learn the entire, not, that you can pretty much reliably learn or discuss politics um, to a, a, a great extent simply from reading the, the, the pagan authors on politics. Same thing with rhetoric, same thing with, with ethics in a way. Um, now, that, that's not to say that that's not to say, so I, how does scripture relate to that? Um, this is a whole different subject. So let me just jump into that for a second. So scripture, scripture, you can think of as having two types of truths in scripture. So one truth are going to be the things that are above nature. Um, th uh, this would be the, the term often you hear is called adventitious. So these truths are adventitious, meaning they're not really native to Adam. They could not even, they could not have been known by Adam 
um, prior, prior to grace, prior to them being brought into creation. So these would be truths like the incarnation, um, truths like the, the means to salvation is through Christ. Um, this would be truths like the Trinity. So you, can't re- you cannot reason, you can reason to the existence, the oneness, the simplicity, and other elements of God. You cannot reason to the triune God. Now, that doesn't mean that the Trinity contradicts reason. It just means that reason itself, by its own power, cannot actually a- a- attain to those truths. You need a truth that, you, you need a, a set of truths that you can, you can trust on faith. So, God says he's triune, God is true, God does not lie, therefore God is triune. So you can then affirm that truth based upon faith in, in God. Um, but the other set of truths within Scripture are really natural truths that are inscripturated. So like the Ten Commandments, you have th- th- that is a, a summary of the natural or of sub- a summary of the moral law, and which is also called the moral law. And as that as a summary, it's simply an inscripturated version of what you could in principle discover through reason. So this is why Aristotle, in the end of his book of ethics, he basically says you sh- children should honor their, honor their father and mother. Of course, uh, very broadly, people would affirm, um, apart from grace, that you shall not murder. So, uh, so th- those are, n- are natural truths inscripturated. And this means that when, when you read the, the law of God in Scripture as it pertains kind of the universal moral law of God in Scripture, you can take, you can read that and know that that is true human morality, um, and you can affirm that by faith because God said it in Scripture. At the same time, you could in principle discover those same truths via reason and via just experience in the world. Um, and so in this way, you have two modes to the same truth, two means of the same truth, faith and reason. Um, now, the thing about politics, politics is something that it's, uh, you want to say it's a sort of trial and error. There's fixed universal principles um, to it, but also it's something that it, it, there's a sort of art to it. This is why people usually call it, the, you know, the art of politics or the political art. Because it's not simply a science you can delineate in a clear geometric sort of way. People have tried, of course, um, but it's it requires uh, it, it requires a, a human element in which experience is is crucial. And so, for this reason, when talking about politics within the Reformed tradition or doing political treatises, you'll have people regularly cite um, again all the pagan authors. And because as it, like they'll cite Plutarch, and then the very next line cite Second Kings, as if they're they're just more examples to try to explain politics. I mean, one one is sacred political history, the other is kind of secular political history. But it's it's expressing it's an example of political life from which you can then build a build the art of politics. All right. So this would be, in, so you, you can, in this way, you can pull from both sources, from pagan sources, from reason, from experience, and from scripture to discuss, so to discuss uh, politics. And that's precisely what people did um, in the Reformed tradition. I, as I read political works from Althusius to Deneau to, um, to Keckerman, uh, these guys are not doing scriptural exegesis as much as you'd think. Actually, it's pretty rare that it would be, actually be exegesis. They might, th- they'll cite examples from, again, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, 1st, 2nd Samuel. Um, they'll cite those as examples in politics, but again, right alongside something they cite out of, um, out of Plutarch. Uh, and uh, so anyway, they, they that, that is what, that's what the that's how these things relate to one. It's, I admit it's a little bit confusing, um, but, uh, but, but, but uh, the, 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 I guess the bottom line is we should, we should take seriously, along with Reformed tradition, we should take seriously the pagan authors of old as ways to think and discuss the perennial questions um, of politics. So let's move back over to this for a second. And uh, this is from, so, even though Calvin does say, oh, yeah, okay, at 22, let's, we'll do this. If the Gentiles have the righteousness of the law naturally engraved on their minds, we certainly cannot say that they're altogether blind as to the rule of life. Okay, rule of life. Nothing indeed is more common than for man to be sufficiently instructed in a right course of conduct by natural law. 
right? Nothing is more common than for man to be sufficiently instructed in a right course of conduct by natural law. So that's key. And, and this is because he's talking about the Gentiles, um, the law naturally engraven on their minds. They're not altogether blind as to the rule of life. Now, in the context, he's saying this is more concerning second table duties. So in first table duties, you know, he's basically saying those blind as moles, um, but not on second table duties. And that, again, flows from his anthropology um, pre and post fall. Now, what's I, what, what I think is interesting in, in section 24 is he then goes on to say, okay, they have considerable more knowledge of the second table. Oops. Consider more, more knowledge of the second table. And that's why, because it's connected to the preservation of civil society. Even here, however, there is something defective. So what's, what's interesting here, and you can read 24, this is the only thing he cites. He, I mean, I, I guess he, he could have cited like polygamy. He could have cited other things as well. But, um, uh, but this is the one for, for whatever reason he cites. And it's, it, it would be what he's essentially saying here is that the the sin uh, the, the common sin of people who even know well the the second table through reason alone through reason experience alone is that they believe that you can overthrow an unjust ruler so i mean th- this is actually a dispute within the reformed tradition so calvin and a lot of the early reformers were kind of negative against revolution against tyrants whereas in the 17th century this from what I could tell, tended to move more towards the right to depose tyrants. Nevertheless, that's not the point here. But Calvin here is, it's interesting, he does point out, yeah, this is the common thing, but this is the only thing he cites. It's actually, this is one of the interesting things that I don't think people realize. There's a lot of negativity within Calvinism or Calvinists or the Reformed tradition towards man. You know, and you see this reflected from scholarship on even in the American founding, it's like, oh, he has a negative view of man. He must be a Calvinist. Like, you know, M- M- Madison says that men are not angels and therefore he must be a Calvinist. I mean, it's very kind of, it's kind of silly, but the, but it, it is true that you, that Calvinists can have a very negative view of man, but the negativity, when we think of that, it, it's because man does not worship God and, and does not worship him rightly. If we have a high view of acknowledging and worshiping God, then the failure to do that, the, the failure to do that, and then to go into idolatry, that's, that, should be, that should make us look upon man as disgusting, right? So as, as horrible, as bad. But that doesn't, that doesn't preclude us from acknowledging that in the inferior things, in the lesser things, man can actually do very well. Um, uh, Augustine used to call this uh, splendid sins. That is, you can, you can be a splendid person outwardly. You can be a virtuous pagan outwardly and in a civil sense. You could be a great statesman. You can be like Cicero. You can be a great, um, a, a, a great um, ruler in your political order. You can be a great citizen. But all of that is just splendid sins. Why? Because you didn't do it to the glory of God. You didn't do it um, for the high, you didn't seek the highest good, even in the lower goods. And so they are nothing but splendid sins. But we can, we have to maintain these distinctions, however. So just because they're good, they, they only do evil, doesn't mean that the substance of action is also evil. So you can do something that is heroic and courageous and glorious, and even down to the ages We can praise them for it, but even when they were not Christians. And yet in the eyes of God, that is, it was good, but it wasn't a theological good. It wasn't praiseworthy. It was not meritorious. In fact, it was evil. And why? Because even though that act outwardly and in substance was good, it was not done to the glory of the true God. And that makes it defective and evil. Um, So again, the negativity towards man should principally um, be not from their failure or their inability to do good works outwardly in a civil sense, but their failure to acknowledge the greatest good that is God himself. Okay. That is really crucial. And I think if we maintain that distinction, it would, it would allow us Calvinists to both 
affirm that high good that that high good of worshiping God in not only Sunday but also all of life. Uh, distinguish that good um, from the good that people who don't um, fulfill that prior good that uh, that uh, the former good. Um, uh, still can perform. They still can perform the substance of good outward action, even when it's evil in the eyes of, of God. Okay. Before man, they can be righteous, and before God, they can be unrighteous. There's no contradiction in that. All right. Now, as we move down, this will all end up pretty in this soon. Um, uh, the, the, the quote from Eric Kahn, I don't, have it in, I don't have it with me right now. I don't have that quote in front of me, but it was it was on Twitter, and it was something to do with how democracy that democracy cannot survive in a multi ethnic society. I'm not 100 percent sure where he that is from. I, I don't I don't know anywhere in in Aristotle where he connects multi ethnic society and democracy and says it can't work. I, I'm saying directly. I do think you can derive that from his thought. I, I just don't know exactly where. Actually, no. What I think what happened was. Torba, Andrew Torba posted it. Eric Kahn said Aristotle was right. So that I, so I don't know where Torba got it, I should say. And, uh, um, and I don't think it's quite right if it's trying to express something that, that Aristotle said directly. But you can, I think, very well see this um, within... You, you can very easily see where this comes from. Politics 5.3... Dissimilarity of stock is also conducive to factional conflict until a cooperative spirit develops. For just as a city does not arise from any chance multitude, so it does not arise in any chance period of time. Hence, those who have emitted joint settlers or later settlers of different stock have, for the most part, split into factions. So, people who are dissimilar of stock um, tend to produce factional conflict. I mean, we see that don't, don't we see that today within England? And we can see that, I mean, really in, the, in our country and in America as well, um, that people of different ancestry tend to group together within their own ethnic identity. And that means it turns into a factional conflict between the various factions. And uh, this would, within a democratic system, I mean, it's one thing, if, if you have like an absolute ruler over a bunch of squabbling ethnic groups, like let's take like, uh, like Saddam Hussein in the 80s and 90s, if you have someone like that, I mean, it, it's challenging, but you can essentially beat down the those who are disputing each other and just use violent force to, to bring order, like that you could do that. But in democracy, where everyone has their own vote, you essentially, you will, you will, you will um, politically speaking, you will turn into different factions. And that perfectly flows from Aristotle's thought. So I'm not, I, I, so, I so I think what was stated, Torah said, what is stated is accurate. But I think it's more of a deduction, a sound deduction of Aristotle's thought than something directly from one of the texts in there. Um, no, so the, the point being, uh, Eric Kahn is right that Aristotle is right. Okay, Eric Kahn is right that um, Aristotle is right that uh, dissimilarity within a, in political order, especially if it's a democracy, is going to lead to, fact, to factions along ethnic lines. And that's just like reflected everywhere in the whole entire um, like world and history today, like his like the world today in history. Um, so that's probably one of the, one of the most demonstrably true statements in um, uh, by appeal to common history or history. So um, now, but then why? P -p wrapping this up, like why could we take what Aristotle says there seriously? That is because. As Calvin just said, Aristotle was uh, retained his natural gifts to fight despite being fallen, despite not knowing the true God, and he op he used them exceptionally. And this was he was a genius, and so things that he he says should uh, things that he said should be taken seriously, um, and uh, yeah, and the same thing with Plato, same thing with. Uh, Cicero and Seneca. You can read these guys with profit. Now, if this statement like this directly contradicts a clear statement of Scripture, then Scripture wins out. Um, if if uh, if Scripture contradicts a a common experience, then the, the 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 Scripture wins out. But when you're discussing 
questions of, of human order, of political order, of ethical action in the context of others, these are usually far more, these are far more complicated than a simple proof text. And so we really need to bring in, when we discuss these things, we need to bring in all different sources, all different experiences from past, and uh, discuss those with reason and, and, uh, and soundness. So, all right, I'm going to leave it at that. So thank you for watching. And uh, if you have any questions, please drop them below in the comments. So thanks.